Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John Hook. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what happened in Virginia, in Roanoke, with these two uh, television employees who were killed uh, this week by a former employee. And the reason we're going to talk about it is not because these were TV employees. In fact, um, just opinion here. I've been kind of concerned that we're overdoing this entire thing because we somehow feel personally touched by it. But workplace violence happens around this country every day. Let me throw some numbers at you. Last month in America, 97 incidents of workplace violence, 33 of them in Arizona. That's one every day. Maybe not surprising in a state that's pushing 6 million people. But nationwide this year, 80 people dead, 137 wounded in workplace violence. Robert Sollers is a recognized expert on workplace violence, 32 years in the field, the author of One is Too Many. He's our guest this week on Newsmaker Sunday. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, John. Uh, when you heard about this, mm -hmm. and then the details started to emerge, and I will run a story here shortly, kind of recapping what happened. Was this classic textbook disgruntled employee who was acting out? I would say so, yes. I mean, he, he bided his time. He admitted that his anger was boiling over and that, you know, the pot was, you know, boiling over and he was just very upset and angry about everything that had happened. Is there a statute of limitations on how long you need to watch an employee, if you know what I mean? Yeah, it had I, been two years since he'd been dismissed. Right. Is there a point where everybody lets their guard down and says, well, you know, he's not a problem anymore? That was years ago. Yeah, normally a business could probably relax and the employees could probably relax after a month, maybe two or three, depending on how violent or upset the employee was when they left the building, when they got terminated. But, you know, coming back after two years or longer in some cases, you, those are the ones that really catch you by surprise. That's an outlier then. Yeah. Let's, let's roll this um, story on the shooting and what happened just to recap what was really a sad, tragic story out of Virginia. Take a look. A reporter and photographer doing a routine live interview in Virginia. As viewers of WDBJ watched, a gunman opened fire on the two of them and a member of the Chamber of Commerce that was being interviewed. Both the reporter, Allison Parker, and photographer Adam Ward were killed. His camera capturing a quick image of the suspect, Vester Lee Flanagan II, a former employee of the station who was also known as Bryce Williams. The suspect uh, up from this incident, this shooting, died at Fairfax and Nova Hospital in Northern Virginia as a result of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Flanagan had sent out a number of tweets after the shooting saying things like, I filmed the shooting, see Facebook. Also, Adam went to HR after working with me one time. We've also learned that he sent out a rambling 23-page statement in the form of a fax to ABC News two hours after the shooting, apparently trying to explain his actions. The general manager of the TV station appeared on air. After many incidents of his anger coming uh, to the fore, uh, he, we dismissed him. And uh, he did not take that well. We had to call the police to escort him from the building. There's still no known motive, and investigators say they don't know if the shooting was racially motivated. Flanagan was black and had formerly complained about racial bias at the station. Troopers caught up with him hours later and hundreds of miles away. He died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. I'm Andrew Hasbun, Fox 10 News. Robert Sollers is our guest on Newsmaker Sunday. He's a recognized expert on workplace violence. 32 years in that particular field. Mm -hmm. When you hear all that... I, I, and again, we, we use this as a backdrop for a bigger conversation. Yes, it was a television station. I understand this led to a, a lot of nationwide coverage from the cable stations on down. But it's really more than that. This is a common, unfortunately, a common occurrence. Unfortunately, it is. And not all workplace violence incidents use a firearm. There's just, I mean, there's two and three times more that don't use firearms but use fists pipe wrenches, uh, ink pens, pencils, coffee cups, whatever the case may be. Can you see this coming, Robert? Do, do people look back usually and say, well, yeah, loose cannon, 
troubled individual. There are warning signs. Does this doesn't just come out of nowhere, right? No. There is, I, I like to say that nobody just snaps. Despite what you know, you'll hear in sound bites on other news shows, there are always warning signs. And it's whether we choose to act upon or ignore those signs as to whether or not how serious it's going to get. So who, who are the people who are the first line of defense on something like this? Actually, it's the, it's the employees themselves. For, because they're the ones that work with the individuals. They have to notice what's going on with the individual, be able to report it to HR, have the trust in HR that they can report it to them or their supervisor and manager and go from there. And then obviously it passes on up to a, uh, HR or their supervisor manager. What, what is the reason that workplace is such a flashpoint? A lot of times be, people get upset at their work duties or things just aren't going right for one particular reason or another. Uh, they get a bad assignment, you know, they get a raw assignment, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And is there kind of that victim mentality that, that pervades this kind of acting out, that somehow they're the victim? In a lot of cases it is. They perceive that they're receiving disparate treatment from their coworkers and their the supervisors and managers. But the key word on that is perceived. Uh, perception is reality. And whatever they perceive to be the truth, there's very few things are going to change their mind. So let's start with an employee, first of all. Mm -hmm. How do you handle a person like this if you're an employee and you're working with someone who's difficult and you think may be violent or dangerous? Well, if, you know, if they're that violent or dangerous, obviously, as a regular employee, you need to be talking to your supervisor and manager and then referring it to HR and letting HR handle it because that's what they're, that's what they're here for, is to handle those types of issues. And as an employee, how does an employee rest assured that management is, quote, unquote, handling it? To be honest, most employees will never know whether or not it's been handled because, again, it's the kind of thing that uh, management and HR will just kind of keep hush-hush and there are, you know, the privacy rules uh, within, you know, HR laws and regulations. Let's talk about that for a minute because these privacy rules strike me as a double-edged sword. Yes, it protects the employee, but on the other hand, Former employers cannot be brutally honest about who they've got or had when another future employer is getting ready to hire that person. You can't, in other words, say, uh, John was a nutcase and I would never hire this guy again. You can't say that again. Or, or you couldn't say, I think he's dangerous. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't hire him. You can't <clears throat> say that. You can, but it has to be off the record and make sure that there is no record of it, of you saying that to the potential new employer. Well, uh, that's interesting. So you're saying that this does go on with employers, that despite the law, employers sometimes will level with one another and say, let me just tell you off the record, I would not hire him. Right. And that's where we, we've gotten away from the phone contact of references, like what we you know, did 20, 30, 40 years ago. And it's all done by email or fax or whatever the case may be. And w when you do that, there's a record yes. of the, um, the former employer telling the new employer, this guy's, you know, wacko, and I wouldn't hire him. He's, you know, he made threats and this and that and something else. This is the amazing thing. This guy who was troubled and had been troubled for 15 years on his former jobs at television mm -hmm. stations continued, here he is, he continued to get hired right. over and over again until finally his time ran out in Roanoke. This is Vester Lee Flanagan, and he is the gunman mm -hmm. and the person responsible who went by Bryce Williams on the air. This is his Facebook we're looking at where he posted all of this in a macabre, horrid, lurid uh, showing. What do you think that was all about? He wanted the attention. He wanted everybody to know that, you know, he was the center of attention, that he was important. He obviously felt that he wasn't getting the uh, attention that he deserved. And again, that falls back into, you know, they wanted, he wanted to be the center of attention and he wasn't. Let's get back to management for a minute. We mm -hmm. talked about what employees can do. What can managers do when you have a flare up of somebody, let's just say it starts the first incident where they really go off the, off the wall the employee. Mm -hmm. 
How should the employer handle it? Well, they need to pull the person off of the floor, whatever floor we're talking about, be it manufacturing, a TV station, or whatever the case may be. Take them aside, talk to them privately, try to find out what's wrong and why they went off on their coworker or client or whatever the case may be. In non-threatening terms? In non-threatening terms. How, uh, give me a, go ahead. kind of play with me here. Okay. You're the manager, I'm mm -hmm. the employee. What do you say to me if I've just blown up in the newsroom? What's going on? What, 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 what are you doing this? You know, you've never done this before. You know, what's going on? Is there something wrong? You know, and then you have to start asking the probing questions. You know, is there something wrong at home? But you say in your book that, that the manager has to listen to this person. That's right. As crazy as what they're <clears> saying <throat> may be, you need to hear them out because they need to be heard. That's right, yeah. Whatever they're going to sit there and talk to you about, you have to sit there and listen and make sure that they are the center of attention while the two of you are together. And make sure that if you're doing work on the computer, make sure that they know that it's their issue that you're typing into the computer to document. And so not, let them know you're else. documenting. Right. In other words, you don't want them to get the impression that you're doing a side work while you're supposedly uh, listening to them. That's right. So hearing them out is important. Mm -hmm. Even is. if what they're saying is nuts. Yeah, unfortunately sometimes, yeah. <laughs> You've got to give them a hearing. You've got to give, you've got to give them a hearing because a good manager who knows their people will pick out the one or two nuggets in an hour-long conversation that can get to the heart of the issue. Back to management for a minute. This strikes me that a lot of this starts in the vetting process of hiring. Mm -hmm. How do you vet this stuff if you're an employer? Well, your pre-employment screening process is the first. Your background checks your you know credit checks if you're allowed there are, there's been so many laws passed in the, in the past 10 years or so against being able to do uh, criminal background checks and credit checks and motor vehicle checks and so on but you have to do the best you can as an employer to check those things do you believe that that as a society we've become too protective of the individual um, that employers cannot get enough information now to to find out about an employee that we've tipped it too far where it's hard to find out and learn ahead of time about a threat? Sometimes that can be the case. Other times the uh, potential employee won't show any signs of anything until they come to work for you. And is, is it a threat to the troubled employee to offer up counseling? Is that taken as an affront and a flashpoint? Again, it depends on the employee. And when the manager or HR is talking to them, you know, they have to feel them out for that and not just as a pat uh, thing to say, okay, you need to go to counseling as part of the, our employee assistance program. You know, they need to make sure that they can control and nudge and say, you know, this might be the, a good thing for you and this will give you somebody to talk to who has better answers than I may have or something along those lines. Robert Sollers is a recognized expert on workplace violence. 32 years in this particular field. He's written the book one is too many and as we mentioned at the outset this year 80 dead 137 wounded in america in workplace violence back in a minute we continue our conversation on newsmaker sunday newsmaker sunday uh, we are covering the story of workplace violence with the backdrop of what happened in virginia this week as a television reporter and cameraman were shot to death during a live television interview in virginia the gunman a former employee of that particular television station a shot and killed these two people and then later killed himself during a chase with police. Robert Sollers is a recognized expert on workplace violence. He is the author of One is Too Many, his book on workplace violence. He has spent 32 years in the field. He is now legally blind, but this is a condition that really uh, came on for you recently, right? Yeah, it's been 12 years ago. But right, you're, still right able to do, you're still able to do your job and it's uh, a mm -hmm. pleasure to have you on the program. I want Thanks. to go back to this horrific shooting that happened here in Phoenix two years ago. You'll remember this if you lived here. This was a mediation about a dispute, and a lawyer and another man ended up shot. Um, let's take you back to 2013.
It was a longtime friend who had loaned Arthur Harmon two of the guns used in last month's shooting in an office complex in central Phoenix. He says Harmon told him he needed the guns for a concealed carry weapons class. His friend had no idea what Harmon had been planning. In an interview with police, Harmon's son told officers his dad had seemed fine in the days that led up to the shooting. He says he didn't seem stressed or emotional. He and his mom attended the mediation hearing that day separately from Harmon. His son says it was going nowhere. His dad Dad wanted $51,000 and the other party wanted $40,000. Neither side was willing to budge. Harmon's son and his wife left before the gunfire erupted. A witness told officers even after the two victims, 48 year old Stephen Singer and 43 year old Mark Hummels, were lying in a pool of blood on the ground, Harmon kept shooting. Firing at them execution style. When officers later told his wife that Harmon was suspected of killing them, she said, quote, Okay, I have no idea. Then replied, If that's what he did, he would commit suicide. The search for the 70 year old, six foot, 220 pound gunman ended in Mesa. Inside Harmon's getaway car, they found dozens and dozens of rounds of ammunition, as well as a loaded AR 15 under a blanket in the passenger seat. Harmon had taken his own life. His body found lying approximately 200 yards away from the vehicle, a pistol in his right hand. Robert Sollers is a recognized expert on workplace violence. How, how come so many times we see at the end of this spasm of violence, the gunman kills himself? Why not just commit suicide? Well, I mean, there are several uh, speculations on why they do this. Number one, they can commit suicide by cop. Or right. they can commit suicide like uh, he, this guy did. But it, it happens 66% of the time out of all workplace violence incidents. They commit suicide in one way or another. They could feel remorse at what they did. They could, you know, they don't want to go to jail. They want an easy way out. They don't want to confront what they've done. And in the, in the midst of it, they want to take out the people who, who, who harm them. Right. As they perceive harm them. Right. So it's get even time, and then at the end of it, when they feel relief, they'll take their own life. Yes. Wow. Um, that, and that seems to be a pattern. We see that a lot. Mm -hmm. What about the suicidal employee? Is the suicidal employee necessarily dangerous to other employees? He could be, depending on what's went on within the business and the reason why he's suicidal. Um, if you'll remember, I think it was 2012, Javon Belcher, a linebacker, promising linebacker for the Kansas City Chiefs, was having problems both on the field and with his girlfriend. He killed her, went to the practice facility. The coaches tried to talk him down, but he shot and killed himself in the parking right. lot anyway. That's right. Now, when we're having this discussion, uh, Robert, you say he. Mm -hmm. How often is it a he versus a she? It's about 95 to 98 percent of the time it'll be male. Why is that? Field. To be honest, I don't think anybody really knows that, that statistic. It, maybe the males are just more volatile when it comes to this, and they, you know, they just keep everything in until they boil over. This is, this is going to sound sexist, but I'll say it anyway. I, is it perhaps that men identify their own self-worth so much through their work? It could, yes, that's definitely true. So this is when, when you have a problem at work, this is something that's really hard to just put it on the back burner. This mm -hmm. becomes part of your being. Uh, anything that, would, that you perceive is uh, challenging your job or the fact that you, to, for you to keep your job would definitely be a stress level that could boil over. Let's talk about warning signs of an employee that's maybe on the edge. What would they be? Well, number one is if they're having attendance problems. Attendance problems? Attendance, if they are constantly coming in late, leaving early, and things like that, that could be a sign that there is something wrong somewhere within their psyche or at home or whatever the case may be. That's interesting. I would not have thought about that because that wouldn't speak to a potential outburst of violence. No, not, not in and of itself. The, of the 21 warning signs that I write about, there, you know, if you've only got one, two, or three of those signs, you're probably okay. You know, the person's upset, and they're just going to blow off steam somewhere down the road or go out and to, a, to the local bar or whatever the case may be. But when you start gathering four, five, six, ten, 
of these signs um, like Flanagan did on Wednesday, then, you know, there's a good chance that something's going to happen, be it with a firearm, pipe wrench, knife, or whatever the case may be. Let, let's, and, and we probably don't have time for all 21, but tick off a few of the 21 warning signs for us. Okay. Number, like I said, number one is attendance problems, uh, bullying, continual excuses, if they're continually making excuses for whatever they've done wrong or whatever the case may be. Uh, drug and alcohol abuse, if they, and one that you would only find, normally would only find, you would think, in high school students or elementary, is if they're cruel to animals in one way or another, and violent video games, music, and uh, movies. If they're addicted to, the, to those, then, you know, they're getting, it's getting into their head that this is the way to solve a problem. What else? Uh, serious stress, both personal and at work. Then you've got disciplinary problems. Uh, you know, if they're constantly getting into trouble at work and getting written up or talked to or whatever the case may be. And uh, like I say, drug and alcohol abuse, if they have that mental health issues, uh, if they have a mental health issue, whether it be just depression or, you know, or something more serious, mm -hmm. uh, like what James Holmes in uh, Colorado's right. had. And so. Yeah, these are, these are things that um, we have all seen in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, does management go on the assumption, well, it probably won't happen here? Because the, the survey that you pointed out in your book is that most employees, a majority, don't think that their workplaces have any kind of plan for this. This, yeah, th this is true. You know, they don't believe, 73% of workers believe that their employers don't care about, you know, workplace violence or have a plan in place, uh, for lack of a better term, an active shooter plan. Interesting. At their business. We're back with Robert Sollers. He's a recognized expert on workplace violence. The final thoughts in a moment on Newsmaker Sunday. The fatal shooting of a television reporter and her photographer in Virginia this week, and then the death of the gunman who was a former employee of that television station, has given rise to the program today where we're talking about workplace violence. Robert Soller is a recognized expert on workplace violence, 32 years in that field, the author of One is Too Many. We talked about warning signs in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Social media has now given us not only insight into groups like ISIS, but it's given us an insight into work, workers who might be a problem and a threat, correct? It, it has. It has. Valuable tool for HR? I would say so, yeah. It's in some of the discussion groups that I've uh, been a part of here recently. You know, HR is looking at, your, at Facebook pages, LinkedIn profiles and such to find out, you know, uh, other than the stuff they shouldn't be thinking about, pol politics and religion, but are you upset at your employer? Are you making threats or uh, disparaging your former employer on Facebook or whatever they may be? What I'm hearing you say, Robert, is that this stuff never comes out of nowhere. No, it never does. Never does. You've always got the warning signs. And it, again, you know, you can either choose to act upon them or ignore them. Where does that delve into paranoia on the part of people because we're, we're all worried about stuff these right, days about yeah. a terrorist attack and everything else. Well, uh, you know, to be honest, it never hurts to be a little bit paranoid. Vigilant. V well, and if you want to call it vigilant, that's f fine. Paranoia is, is yet another term for that as well. You know, you have to be aware of what's going on around you. And to do that, you have to be a little bit, you have to be more vigilant and you have to be a tad bit paranoid to be paying attention to everything going on around you and the way people are acting and uh, if they're depressed or if they're you know, upset or whatever the case may be. Is this on the rise in America? We've got 30 seconds left. Is there, are we seeing an increase in this kind of thing? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. And why? Because of the economy the way it is. You know, they say the economy is going good, but you know, wages don't, aren't rising that well. There's still a lot of people that are dropping out of the workforce. There's a lot of serious stress. Divorce is actually on the increase. Mm -hmm. So f People are stressed. F people are just stressed. Robert Sollers, the author of One is Too Many, an expert on workplace violence. Thank you for being with us. Very, very helpful, your information. We'll see you next week on Newsmaker Sunday.